Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about Pinochet apologism. So we'll be talking about Chilean political history, mostly focusing on Salvador Allende's presidency, Pinochet's coup, and subsequent dictatorship, topics that everyone always seems to have very strong opinions on. So let's get started with a brief refresher. Salvador Allende was the democratically elected socialist president of Chile. He was the head of Popular Unity, a broad coalition of left-wing parties, and he was in office from November 1970 until September 11, 1973. On that day, he was ousted in a military coup led by the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, Augusto Pinochet. Allende killed himself as the armed forces stormed the presidential palace, and Pinochet then went on to kill 3,000 people and torture or detain upwards of 40,000 more in a dictatorship that would last until 1990. So quite a bad guy. Now, there's actually a lot of people who apologize for Pinochet, the coup, and or his dictatorship, including in Chile today. Generally, these people come from one of three camps. Firstly, there's the killing leftists is good, free helicopter rides, all hail Pinochet sort of people, who I'm just going to ignore. Secondly, there's people who believe that Pinochet did what he had to do to save Chile from a Marxist dictatorship and that his rule resulted in peace and prosperity thanks to the glory of the free market. Lastly, there's people who would normally consider themselves staunchly pro-democracy, anti-violence, etc. They're careful not to imply direct support for Pinochet, but they nonetheless end up apologizing for him anyway. They might say that, for example, the coup was regrettable and they don't agree with Pinochet's atrocities, but Allende was being undemocratic, promoting violence, mismanaging the economy, etc. So the coup was necessary to stop him from ruining the country. And they also tend to praise Pinochet's economic policies quite a bit. This group reveals an unsettling tendency among many centrists or centre-right types, where they're suddenly happy to say good things about a violent, undemocratic, right-wing dictatorship, as long as it means getting one up over the leftists. Now, while I don't think it's possible to ever justify a military coup against a democratically elected government, or anything about the murderous dictatorship that resulted from it in this case, I'm nevertheless going to discuss the most common apologist talking points and show that the ways in which people apologize for Pinochet, misguided as they may be, are just wrong anyway. Namely, the idea that the coup was a reaction to Allende's bad governance, the argument that Allende and his popular unity coalition were being violent and undemocratic, and lastly, the idea that the economy was great under Pinochet, thus resulting in Chile becoming an exceptionally prosperous nation today. So, Let's get started. Why was there a coup? So firstly, I want to address the argument that the coup was a result of Allende's bad governance. The historian Steve J. Stern made a very compelling argument that Allende, knowing that his democratic principles put him at the mercy of the military, expected that his presidency would eventually fall to a coup, and that he fought this before he even took office. Now, why might he have expected a coup? Because not only was there a long history of single-minded opposition to his political candidacies, but the agitation against him was open, shameless, and began long before he had ever taken office. Allende wasn't some political newcomer. He had run for president four times over almost two decades, in 1952, 58, and 65 before finally being elected in 1970. He even almost won the election in 1958, losing by only 3% of the vote. And in 58 and 64, he got more than a third of the popular vote. So his victory was a long time coming. His politics were pretty much the same throughout, democratic socialism. Everyone was very familiar with him, and they had no real reason to assume that he wanted to become a dictator. Despite his clear mainstream popularity and demonstrated committal to electoral politics, his mere existence was apparently pretty terrifying for many. For example, in 1964, the conservatives threw their support behind the centre-right Christian Democrats specifically to avoid splitting the vote against Allende. Then, with the help of $2.6 million from the CIA, more than half of their total campaign funding, the Christian Democrats won the election. That might sound like a conspiracy theory, but the US actually admitted it in the Church Committee report. So, machinations against Allende began quite early, and this continued into the future. Then, during the 1970 presidential election campaign, there was a far-reaching propaganda campaign, largely funded by the CIA, which exercised a whole lot of control over the country's biggest newspaper, El Mercurio. This campaign tried to paint Allende as a big bad evil communist who wanted to be the Chilean Stalin and put everyone into gulags, in spite of the fact that everyone knew what his ideology actually entailed by then. 
So that gives you an idea of the opposition tactics at the time. Later, in September of that year, two days after Allende won the presidential election, the second-in-command of the armed forces at the time, General Carlos Prats, was visited by numerous important businessmen and right-wing politicians who euphemistically asked him what the armed forces thought about the election of Allende. Prats was also visited by an important leader of the Christian Democrats, the governing centre-right party of the time, who informed him that President Eduardo Frey was seriously considering a self-coup, that is, a dissolution of the non-executive branches of the government to hand himself complete control just to prevent Allende's assumption of the presidency. Now, this probably seems like a lot of propaganda and a whole lot of talk of coups to happen before Allende was even in office. But trust me, the worst is yet to come. General René Schneider, who was the commander-in-chief of the armed forces at the time, was a constitutionalist, and he coined what is aptly known as the Schneider Doctrine, the idea that the Chilean armed forces shouldn't interfere in the democratic process, that they should remain apolitical. Basically, this means no coups. The fact that Schneider even needed to clarify his position on this, combined with what Pratt's said about people coming to meet him, pretty clearly shows us what the climate was like at the time. The opposition really wanted to somehow find a way to avoid Allende actually being confirmed as president, and they saw the involvement of the military as a possible avenue for this. Then, in October, one month before Allende was to be confirmed as president, right-wing paramilitaries, with the support and direction of the CIA, murdered Schneider in a botched kidnapping attempt when he predictably, you know, due to being a military general and all, pulled out a pistol and defended himself. Now there's no ambiguity here at all. Schneider was killed because he was seen as a roadblock to a coup. On that note, it's important to stop for a second to talk about US intervention. Now I personally don't like to blame the US for everything. They do deserve copious amounts of criticism, but this was not a CIA conspiracy. It was the CIA amplifying the domestic right and the center right who were by far the principal actors. Regardless, it is important to point out that President Richard Nixon directly ordered the CIA to foment a military coup after Allende won the presidential election, which they duly tried to do. Again, this is all in the Church Report released by the US Senate in 1975. It is not a conspiracy theory. Now, usually the reply to that is to say, well, hang on, the Soviets supported Allende too, and that's true. The KGB was active in Chile during Allende's presidency, but their support was quite limited and it was nothing remotely like the CIA's fervent attempts to spur a coup. In fact, the KGB's actions in Chile were not really focused on Allende at all, and were more about trying to reduce American influence in the country. They mostly actually consisted of counter-espionage efforts against the CIA, so the two aren't really comparable at all. Anyway, moving on. Unfortunately for Schneider's assassins, Eduardo Frey, who was still the president at the time, followed convention and named Carlos Prats the second in command of the armed forces as Schneider's successor, about a week before Allende was to take up the presidency. Prats was also an adherent of the Schneider Doctrine, and thus he was uninterested in a coup. In the wake of that failure, there was one route remaining for the right wing. In Chile, the president only automatically assumes the presidency with a majority, not a plurality. Allende won the election with 36.6% of the vote, ahead of the conservative candidate with 35%. In this event, the Congress chooses between the top two candidates. The convention here, which had held for almost 50 years, was that this vote was merely symbolic. Congress would always confirm whoever got the highest percentage of the vote. The right wing, however, broke convention and voted for their own candidate instead, and tried to convince the Christian Democrats to do the same. Rather than simply follow convention, the Christian Democrats then demanded that Allende sign an unprecedented agreement that he wouldn't break the constitution in exchange for their votes at his confirmation. And yes, this was technically legal, but it's still significant that they broke 50 years of democratic convention to try and stop Allende from becoming president in an election that he had already won. So as you can clearly see, even before Allende assumed the presidency, there was already all kinds of initiatives to try and stop him from even doing so. Now at this point, it should already be really obvious that coup agitation had absolutely nothing to do with Allende's performance in government, because he wasn't even governing and all of this was already happening. Now if I went over every single example of this sort of thing, this video would be about 15 hours long. So instead I'm going to skip to 1973, and I'm going to make an honourable mention for the CIA, who allocated 10 million to coup agitation after Allende was actually confirmed as president. 73 was a crazy year. The midterm elections took place in early March, 
with all of the seats in Congress and half of the seats in the Senate up for grabs. The Christian Democrats and the Conservatives actually joined together to form one party, the Confederation of Democracy, specifically to oppose Allende's presidency. The motivation for this was simple. If they won a two-thirds majority in the Congress, they could then vote to impeach Allende. Since Pratt's was still commander-in-chief of the army, a coup was mostly out of the question, so for now, they thought they'd try their hands at democracy. Instead, popular unity actually increased their share of the popular vote, from 36% in 1970 to 44%, and they gained seven seats in the process. This was seen as an endorsement of Allende's presidency, as his popularity only increased in the last three years since he'd taken office. Having failed democratically, the opposition went right back to agitating for a coup. Soon after, a coup attempt finally came. Many people don't actually know this, but Pinochet's coup was not the first try. This one, known as the Tancatazo, happened four months earlier in June. It was instigated in the army by the Fatherland and Liberty Nationalist Front. This was a fascist paramilitary group that had been formed in 1971 by people who were involved in the assassination of General Schneider, specifically to oppose Allende's presidency. And yes, they were actual fascists. I mean, look at them. Tanks surrounded the presidential palace, and troops fired on journalists who were there to film the commotion. That was Argentine cameraman Leonardo Henriksen, who filmed his own death during the Tancatazo. Luckily, at least for a time, Prats was still the commander-in-chief, so the coup failed to draw the wide support that it needed to succeed, and it was quickly put down. In light of that failure, the opposition nonetheless kept agitating for a coup. On the 22nd of August, they called a special session of Congress. The opposition controlled Congress, passed a motion which condemned Allende as undemocratic, and openly called on the armed forces for another coup. This motion held no legal power, it was merely symbolic. It could have said, Allende smells his own farts, please military, give us a coup, and it probably still would have been passed. Now I hope that we can all agree that calling a special session of Congress to ask the armed forces to please come and give us a coup is a pretty undemocratic thing to do. Fortunately for them, they had been attempting to manufacture a scandal against Carlos Prats to get him to resign. He was being harassed basically everywhere that he went by opposition supporters, hoping for a reaction that they could then use to shame him into resigning. Prats was being heckled in traffic by fellow motorists. Now he did something incredibly stupid and pulled out his pistol in a road rage incident, and he shot at a car in the process. He was then attacked by a huge crowd of motorists and narrowly escaped being lynched. He immediately tried to resign, but Allende convinced him to stay on. Nonetheless, this event greatly damaged his prestige in the military. As a result, he resigned on the 23rd of August, one day after the Congress had called for a coup. Then, on Prats' recommendation, Allende named Pinochet as his successor, assuming that he also adhered to the Schneider Doctrine. As we all know now, he was quite wrong. And then, on September 11th, after years and years of agitation from the opposition, they finally got what they wanted as Pinochet finally led a coup that succeeded. Now, if someone takes all this information into account and still ends up saying, the coup happened to save Chile from Allende's bad governance, then I'm really not sure what to tell them. The coup was quite clearly something that the opposition had been hoping for since before Allende was even president. Then the second that Prats was gone, the coup happened within weeks. Certain factions clearly saw Allende as a threat to their interests and wanted him gone long before he had ever had a chance to govern. Apologists often also say that since the opposition had a majority, that means that what they did is okay and not anti-democratic. But there's governments all over the world at this very moment that are governing without having a legislative majority. So unless you also think that the Republican-controlled Congress under Obama, for example, would have been justified in seeking a military coup by virtue of numbers, then you're just kind of being a little bit obtuse there. This happens all the time in liberal democracies. The opposition could have tried many different strategies within the democratic system. They could have tried to convince some popular unity legislators to help pass an impeachment vote. They could have kept blocking Allende's legislation, which they did a lot of, by the way. They could have sought a plebiscite, which Allende had actually expressed clear interest in, by the way. They could have waited for the next presidential election, which they probably would have won, assuming they united together again. But they didn't. Rather than allowing Chilean democracy to function, they instead tried to foment a coup consistently for three years. That is just not defensible. Period. Were popular unity violent? And was Allende being undemocratic? No. Allende and his party were not violent, nor were they associated with any violent groups. The actual violent leftist groups of the time, such as the Mir, 
were opposed to popular unity and Allende. This was because they disapproved of the democratic path that he was taking towards socialism, believing that the only viable path was violent revolution. Considering the reaction to Allende's attempts at democratic socialism, I think they might have had a point, by the way. Now, it is true that during his presidency, there were some attacks by other leftist groups. But these were few, less than a dozen, and they were coming from the very same groups that were not associated with popular unity, and in fact were actively opposed to them. Violence from far-right paramilitaries, especially Fatherland and Liberty, who by the way were funded by the CIA, was far more common. They routinely carried out assassinations, especially against people in the military who they thought didn't support a coup, they attacked popular unity supporters, they sabotaged infrastructure, etc, etc. The only armed group that was actually associated with Allende was the group of personal friends. This was not a paramilitary group, but rather a group of personal bodyguards formed in the wake of the assassination of General Schneider out of a fear of a similar attempt on Allende's life. A far cry from leftist terrorists, obviously. Usually though, when people are talking about this violence, they are more referring to street violence, such as that between opposite groups of protesters. Now, street violence did happen, especially after the midterm elections of 73. For example, here's a video of right-wing supporters evidently quite unhappy with the news that Allende had increased his share of the vote. But this violence had very little to do with popular unity. Eugenia Pagliaracchi, a professor of Latin American studies, notes in her study on street violence during Allende's presidency that it increased due to the influence of the fascist Fatherland and Liberty paramilitary group on the mainstream opposition parties. Basically, they internalized its narrative that the supposed totalitarian Marxism of Allende needed to be confronted in the streets. She later concludes that, for the opposition, violence was not an occasional resource, it simply became a regular political practice. So the violence that is often used as a justification for a coup actually came from the very people who wanted the coup to happen. Now this might sound familiar to you, and that's because this is somewhat of a historical theme. Right-wing violence, even that against leftists, is often framed as the leftist's fault. And this is probably the best possible example of it. Right-wing groups were committing flagrant acts of violence in the street, and then this violence would be blamed on Allende's government and used to justify a coup. This was obviously a very good tactic because people are still using it to justify the coup to this very day. Anyway, what about the idea that Allende was being undemocratic? Well, as I mentioned earlier, on the 23rd of August 1973, the opposition-controlled Congress passed a motion that condemned Allende's supposed violations of the Constitution. This motion is full of harir. It had no legal power and it just plain lies. For example, it accuses Allende of imprisoning opposition journalists, which is something that simply never happened. Its purpose had very little to do with its content, it was just more agitation for a coup. These sorts of accusations were being thrown at Allende before he was even in office, so this was nothing new. So the people who claim that Allende was being undemocratic are pretty much always just taking at face value the things that the clearly unreliable opposition was saying during his presidency. Did he violate the constitution though? Well, indirectly and in one specific area, yes. Allende's government had a bad habit of not enforcing court rulings regarding its land reform campaign. Companies that had their land acquired during said campaign were often appealed to the courts. They'd sometimes win, and then Allende's government just wouldn't do anything to enforce the rulings. But this one thing is hardly what people today have in mind when they're talking about all the supposed undemocratic measures taken by Allende. In fact, if any of them are watching this video, I can almost guarantee you that they've never heard about this before. So no problem guys, glad to help. That's it though. It's certainly nothing near the picture that many apologists paint. I think if they really cared so much about the constitution, they would probably worry much more about the very unconstitutional, three year long agitation for a coup. Now I'm going to sum this up with a speech directly from Allende. Immediately following the first coup attempt, Allende gave a speech before popular unity supporters outside the presidential palace, while emotions were obviously running very high. In the wake of the coup, the crowd chanted for him to dissolve Congress, and some called for an armed solution. But Allende told them sternly that he would remain loyal to his word, that he would continue to seek change through democratic means. He denounced the violence on both sides and said that he would not dissolve Congress because, I quote, that would be absurd. In this same speech, he also floated the possibility of a plebiscite to resolve disputes with the opposition. But again, the opposition was not very interested in democratic solutions. I've saved the best for last. Do the economic ends justify the means? No, they don't. 
You can't justify a military coup against a democratically elected government with economics or anything ever. That's all folks. Okay, no, I'm not actually done. Because while I could actually end it there, the arguments that apologists tend to make are just plain wrong anyway. Now yes, there was indeed an economic crisis under Allende in 1973, the year of the coup. This crisis was, however, influenced by outside factors. For example, there were harsh US sanctions, and also the domestic right and centre right were actively trying to create artificial shortages of basic goods. For example, they bribed shopkeepers and distribution centres to hoard their goods rather than sell them. You're currently watching actual footage of hoarded goods being discovered and distributed. So this really happened. Now this is just the tip of the iceberg. They used plenty of other means of economic sabotage as well. I personally think that it's pretty heinous to intentionally attempt to sabotage your own country's economy and deprive your own people of basic goods to try and spur a coup against the incumbent president. It's ridiculous in fact, but it happened. However, arguing about responsibility for the crisis is kind of irrelevant, because an economic crisis is not justification for a coup. Economic crises are fairly common, and very few of them ever end in military coups. There's one currently ongoing in Argentina right now under the right-wing government of Mauricio Macri, for example. And as far as I know, no one is calling for a coup, nor is anyone actively trying to sabotage their own people's access to basic goods in an effort to spur one. Now, what about the supposed miracle under Pinochet, though? Did that happen? No. Firstly, to amplify their praise for Pinochet, people will often say that Chile didn't have a very good economy relative to the region until he came along. But that's just wrong. In 1970, before either Allende or Pinochet ever got their hands on things, by GDP per capita, Chile was already the third wealthiest nation in South America, so that idea just doesn't hold water. Continuing on, it's time for some boring ass fucking graphs. According to the World Bank, GDP per capita in the years of Allende's presidency went from $954 to 1667 but in the Pinochet years it more than halved to 776 in 1975. It recovered to reach a high of 3016 in 1981, and then, just like under Allende, there was an economic crisis in Chile, with GDP per capita falling to pre-1973 levels. By the time Pinochet left the presidency, it had recovered to 2500, which was actually below the average for Latin America and the Caribbean at the time. In fact, over the course of his dictatorship, GDP per capita growth per year averaged 1.83%. But the average for Latin America and the Caribbean during this period was 2.39%. Chile's gross GDP per capita increased by 50%, while that of Latin America and the Caribbean increased by 121%. That's not a miracle. That's far below average economic growth. Pinochet's below average economic performance has been played up so much that people just take it for granted. But hey, gross measures like GDP per capita don't really tell us much about human welfare as that wealth could be distributed in any which way. So, what about other indicators? Well, not good either as it turns out. Pinochet gutted access to basic public services, repealed a lot of workers' rights, banned unions, abolished unemployment insurance, privatised education, etc etc. Predictably, this resulted in some pretty bad performance on key indicators of social welfare. Unemployment under Pinochet averaged 20%, up from about 4% during Allende's government. Chile's Gini coefficient, which measures inequality with lower numbers being better, went up markedly during his tenure, making it one of the most unequal countries in Latin America. The number of people living in poverty doubled during Pinochet's dictatorship, which is quite a feat. When he stepped down, the poverty rate was at a ginormous 44%. These are frankly god-awful figures. So when people talk about the economic miracle under Pinochet, what they're really saying is that everything was below average and things were pretty terrible for the average person. Now, the point of an economy is not to make the numbers go up at a below average rate. It's to serve the needs of human beings. It's pretty clear that the economy under Pinochet failed spectacularly at that. Obviously, this was by design. Pinochet didn't reform the economy with the idea of creating a just country that served the needs of everyone. He wanted to make a lot of money for corporations and already well-off people. I'm sure that he was more successful at that than the stuff that I'm talking about. But I don't think that's what most of us have in mind when we discuss economic performance, unless you're like a coke executive or something. The next apologist talking point is usually to say, 
Well, the subsequent democratic governments kept a lot of Pinochet's reforms, and then they did good. The implication being that Pinochet deserves credit for stuff that happened once he was gone. Now, firstly, I've pretty much never heard anyone try to give credit for the present state of a country's economy to a leader who's been gone for 29 years, except in the case of Pinochet. But I guess when things during his tenure were so bad, then the only option you really have is to try and give him credit for things that happened when he was gone. He was in power for nearly 17 years. He had a whole lot of time to make things work himself. You don't get credit for things getting better once you're gone after you had 17 years to get things right and failed miserably. Secondly, pretty much every government ever keeps some things from previous governments. Nothing about that is unique. For example, Pinochet and all the subsequent democratic governments kept the copper mines that were nationalized by Allende in state hands. Now copper represents 15% of the country GDP and 50% of its export income, by far the most important sector of its economy. But weirdly enough, no one's high-fiving Allende's corpse over this. What Pinochet actually did leave behind was a whole host of problems. There's the whole rampant poverty and unemployment thing that we just went over, but he also implemented anti-labor legislation that was so systematically entrenched that democratic governments have actually had a lot of problems trying to fix it. He privatized the pension system and abolished unemployment allowances. In 1981, he abolished tuition-free public university education, and this was only re-implemented in 2018. And guess what? He also privatized the general education system, and he abolished universal health care which left millions without access to affordable health care until the early 2000s. That's just a taste of it. If someone looks at this clear mess that he left behind and still thinks that he deserves credit for things getting better without him, then I think they might just really, really want to like Pinochet. And the people who make this same argument also like to characterize Chile as some sort of unique success in Latin America to play up the supposed achievements of Pinochet. And yes, for its region at least, Chile does do quite well, as it always has, before Pinochet and before Allende. But these people conveniently ignore the fact that Uruguay and Argentina exist. On pretty much all indicators, these three countries are so close to the point that there's really no meaningful differences. GDP per capita, minimum wage, levels of poverty, unemployment, living standards, etc etc. This is obviously pretty inconvenient to the idea that Chile is some sort of uniquely prosperous paradise amidst the sea of barbarians rolling around in their own shit, which I'm pretty sure is the standard image of Latin America that a Pinochet apologist has in their head. So obviously they just kind of pretend that these two countries don't exist and ignore them so they can keep up with the myth of Chilean exceptionalism. Why though? Well, these two countries also had dictatorships during the 70s and the 80s that also pushed free market reforms. Their economies were, like Chile, quite bad under these dictatorships, and more neoliberal governments followed under democracy. Yet there's no one touting the Argentine miracle or the Uruguay well, because the same sort of neoliberalism didn't do so well there. Rather, it actually led to severe crises in both countries, in 2001 in Argentina and 2002 in Uruguay. Then, post-crisis, the country's recovery was overseen by leftist social democratic governments, the Kirchners in Argentina who ruled from 2003 until 2016, while in Uruguay the leftist coalition, Frente Amplio, has led since 2004. So yeah, fairly inconvenient for the idea that a right-wing dictatorship left Chile as an exceptional country, unequal in its region. This brings me to the real point. None of this is actually about what really happened. Chilean history has become something of a worldwide ideological battleground. The coup was a dramatic, unique event in a particularly tumultuous historical period. The first ever democratically elected Marxist president was deposed in an explicitly capitalist military coup. That is a lot more spectacular and a lot more exploitable for propaganda purposes than Uruguay and Argentina, where right-wing military coups deposed governments that were already themselves right-wing. So basically, for many people ideologically inclined towards capitalism, Allende must not only be remembered as an abject failure, Pinochet, unseemly as he may be, must be remembered as a success in order to contrast his capitalism with Allende's socialism. And now, to recap. Firstly, agitation for a coup was extremely prevalent even before Allende took office and this continued throughout his presidency. The coup had nothing to do with Allende's governance and everything to do with the fact that a lot of powerful people 
were never willing to tolerate a leftist president, democratically elected or not. Secondly, there were no violent groups associated with Allende's Popular Unity Party, and most of the violence during his presidency came from the right wing. Allegations of unconstitutional actions against Allende have little to no basis. Allende remained committed to his democratic principles even in the wake of the first abortive coup attempt. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the so-called Chilean miracle never happened. Pinochet actually presided over a below-average economy that was an absolute disaster on every indicator of human welfare. He left many issues in his wake, such as leaving the country without many basic social services that it had previously had. That things improved once he was gone doesn't absolve him at all, as, well, the key reason that things improved was the fact that he was gone. And, most importantly, absolutely none of these arguments could possibly justify a coup against a democratically elected leader regardless. So that's the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching if you've somehow made it this far. If you enjoyed the video, I humbly ask you to click all the buttons and such, such as subscribe, like, comment, etc. You can also follow me on Twitter at Bad Empanada, as you could probably guess. And I'd just like to apologize for problems with the sound and stuff during this video. This is actually the first time I've ever recorded my own voice, so it's kind of intimidating. But I hope that it was informative enough to kind of help you look past the mouth clicks and the um, pops and stuff. I'm kind of learning as I go, so my next video will certainly be much better. So be on the lookout for that if you like this one. So yeah, thanks a lot, and if you like good informed left-leaning takes on history, society, politics, particularly that of Latin America, then yeah, stay tuned to my channel.